Welcome again, everybody, to the Mile High Basketball Guys podcast. I am your host slash team leader of the Rocky Mountain Sports Report Nuggets team, Santi Rico, and I am joined today by my co-inspirer, Mr. Michael Squires. How you doing, Michael? I'm doing fantastic. It's a beautiful Sunday morning. It truly is, man. I'm loving this weather. I can't complain given that it hasn't snowed in a good minute. I seen it hit 50 degrees and I was like, well, that's going to be hot. Yeah, I've been working <laughs> down in Pueblo lately and, and I'm sweating. I'm sweating down there. I'm used to the cold and now it's starting to warm up. Oh, I wish it was summer all the time, honestly. You know who else is starting to warm up? Jamal Murray. <laughs> <laughs> yes, son. All right. And that'll get us right into what we're trying to do. We're going to be going over the last two weeks of Nuggets basketball, starting with the game that happened on our last stream against the Atlanta Hawks in Atlanta. Uh, it kind of went how I thought it would go. I, I wanted the Nuggets to win with everything in my heart, but I, I couldn't see them getting past Trey Young and uh, John Collins and Clint Capella. I think those guys really make up a solid front three, um, and they managed to edge it out. Trey Young definitely had a performance. What do you have to say, Michael? Oh, yeah, I definitely agree. Uh, I predicted a win for us, which definitely didn't come to fruition. Mm -hmm. But we definitely played good until the third quarter. It was the third quarter where Ice Trey just started to go off. He was hitting threes like crazy. He was unguardable. Uh, and then we went to double team him. He was just lobbing it up to Clint and Collins, and they were just punishing the rim. So it was just a, a good performance on their part because they do a good job of spreading the basketball around. Trey Young shoots from so far out that he demands people to come out to the perimeter. And then he's throwing lobs from half court, basically, to yeah. Capella and Collins. So having a game plan for that we didn't have it uh, capella's always been a thorn in our side he's always been a uh, kryptonite to Jokic, even when he when he mm. was with the rockets so going against him i knew it was going to be a challenge and i was hoping that the joker rose to the occasion as he's done multiple times in this season mvp candidate uh, i expected that type of performance for him but uh ultimately his kryptonite prevailed and uh they got the win, but it was a lot closer than what the scoreboard will indicate. Yeah. And it, I mean, the scoreboard at the end of the day, it was still only eight points. It's not a huge right. blowout victory for the Atlanta Hawks. And uh, yeah, th there's something to be said for Clint Capella and the way he plays against us. He is a paint beast mm -hmm. incarnate. That man grabs those rebounds and Trey found him like a, a ton of times for those mm -hmm. lobs and for the rolls. And he shot eight for nine, which just says, you know, nobody could really guard him inside the paint. And high he doesn't take shots. jumpers. Right. He's taking high percentage shots, and it, Trey's making the game easy for him. And that's yeah. just evidence right there. And and Trey had 15 assists. Every time that he would go for a drive, he would sling the ball outside or find somebody else making a cut. I mean, we really had no answer for a guy as agile and versatile. As no, he absolutely controlled the tempo for sure, mm -hmm. uh, especially starting in the third quarter. Uh, he started good shooting lights out. He hit a, like five or six straight shots. And once we started to try to help, it opened up other things. So, like, he definitely controlled how the game was going to be played. And he just played at his pace, at his comfort level, and it worked out pretty yeah, well for him. Absolutely. He he paced it, and he played exactly the kind of game that he's built for, which is stretching the floor and finding the open man. Uh, so he's, he had a great show. Uh, Jokic, you said, struggled. I mean, only 15 points, and mm -hmm. he got he got the 10 rebounds, so a double-double, just not as efficient or effective as a double-double we would expect from Mr. Jokic. Well, if we have 15 points, we need Michael Porter Jr. to at least have 20 mm -hmm. on and so uh, we just didn't have the performance that we needed from our three-headed monster that we're starting to form. But uh, that's just one thing that led to our loss. I think another thing that played a pretty big contribution was uh, the fact that all the starters went had a negative plus or minus. So yeah. we definitely didn't play complimentary basketball. We usually give our bench a nice lead. So that way, if they don't have a very productive second quarter, which is kind of been our biggest struggle this year is 
we start hard, start hot, and then fizzle out towards the second. Yeah. But that's because normally it's the the bench that's not helping out the starters. But when the starters go negative, then it really puts the bench in a hole, and mm-hmm. then that's what they're built for. And the bench didn't do an awful job. Uh, I mean, we had two main scorers from the bench with Facundo and Monte Morris, but uh, their their performance alone was excellent for the bench. I mean, thirty bench points is something to be said, and they uh, they just weren't able to make up for the deficit that was created by our starters. Yeah, and that's what I mean by complementary basketball. Like our starters normally leave it close at least. So if our bench goes for thirty, that's normally a win. So mm-hmm. if our starters were to produce how they normally do and then the bench come and produce how they did in that game. I kind of feel like we wasted a good bench game um, for that game. Another thing to point out that happened was uh, Gallinari had a, had a decent game. He didn't go yeah. off, but in a he revenge game. No, he had 12 points though, you know, so I look, I look, I look, keep my eye out for things like that. You know, people will try to play better against their old teams and Gallo off the bench went plus five and dropped 12 points. I think it, you know, that was, he's playing with a little bit of passion and uh, and that kind of helped him out. Yeah, a little chip on his shoulder for yeah, sure. And it seems yeah. like a lot of the former Nuggets players really came to play. Like uh, moving forward after this loss, we had the Trailblazers, which we luckily won. But Melo had a game. Right. He if it was up to Melo, he would. Oh, you hit your mic. <laughs> my apologies, my dogs. Yeah, they. <laughs> They like to bark at everything that goes by, but yeah, if it was up to Melo in that second quarter alone, he dropped 16 points. So uh, he looked like the Melo of old. He looked like mm-hmm. the mid-range master where he wasn't really hitting too many threes, but he was putting on a clinic from mid-range. Uh, Najee couldn't stay with him. He was putting moves on him. He looked like the Melo of old. Uh, yeah. I almost almost thought he was wearing a Nuggets jersey. I was like, well, yeah. who, who is this guy? But yeah. like, yeah, that was a, the back-to-back little revenge games right there where uh, – but Melo had a way more of a productive game. And honestly, his efforts kept them in the game. That second quarter he had, uh, it was start, it was about to get carried away. We were mm-hmm. about to really put our stamp on the game. But uh, his efforts kept it close. This game was a lot closer than I thought it should have been. Yeah, and, and the Nuggets started off strong. Uh, we had a 34-point first quarter. Uh, we, we usually – bust past that 30 point mark. Sometimes we even get into the 40 points, but we're always that top heavy team. And then you see, you know, Mello having a good second quarter and all it usually bites us in the second quarter, you know, in the second half of that first half, the, the other team MO. figures us out and it's just well, I think a, it has to do a lot with the bench. So our starters, they go set the tone and then it's up to our bench in that second quarter. So most of the time when mm-hmm. we fall out, it's because the bench really, didn't do the best job that they possibly could. And I'm not saying that they do the worst, but that's why the starters play as many minutes as they do. Mm-hmm. Like Jokic and Murray and Michael Porter Jr., they get, they're get they getting a lot of minutes. Uh, Compazzo is getting a lot of minutes off the bench as well. But for the most part, the rotation is almost set, I feel like. team the Players aren't really playing unless we're having a blowout. If we get a blowout win, that's when you'll see some more players. Like So, for instance, only eight players played in this game. Yeah. So – that's barely a rotation too. Eight right. So is not yeah, the starters were in there a lot. So yep. basically the three people that came off the bench were just for the starters to get a little bit of rest. Yeah. And, and Michael Porter jr. Played the most minutes out of all the starters. He had 40 minutes in there, obviously between small forward and power forward, but with only 12 points, I mean, you can't really say that he was the most efficient person out there. But with 10 rebounds and one block, that's exactly what we need from Porter Jr. If you're not going to go give us 20 points, you have to at least give us 10 rebounds. Uh, when he does both, it's extremely ideal. But uh, yeah. to give us one or the other, I think that just goes to show you that he's actually evolving his game. And when he's not shooting as well, he's not taking himself totally out of the game. So I actually like to see that he – pulled down 10 rebounds for us, even though he only put up 12 points. Um, but that 12 points is a solid contribution. I it think is. we uh, we just expect so much from the young star that uh, if he's not dropping 20, if he's not going you mm-hmm. know, three of six or four of eight from three, that it, it's almost a disappointing game from him. But I guess that's just how high his ceiling really is. Yeah, we we kind of want him to be that full product already, and it's very difficult for someone to do that. 
Um, there, there is definitely something to be said for Michael Porter Jr.'s defensive and rebounding capabilities, given that, uh, you know, he got 10 rebounds. He usually gets a block a game. He is the only player on the roster with at least a block a game on average. So defensively, you can't underestimate his contributions, even though he is particularly more effective on the offensive end. And he's been slashing to the basket. It's been mm-hmm. uh, so obvious in, That's in the love. games that I've been watching. Uh, he's been putting back shots, put back dunks. He's been mm-hmm. putting the ball on the floor and getting to the rack. And I think that we've been mentioning how if he does that, his game would open up a lot more. And surprisingly, he's just getting more rebounds mm-hmm. floating around that basket area more. So I think he's starting to realize where he can get more success and it's not only at the three-point line yeah he's he's finding his niches in this nba game he he's an aggressive rebounder he's Mm -hmm. one of the fastest six foot ten fellas on the court and he can slam that ball home anytime he wants oh yeah he he punishes the rim absolutely yeah he's the best dunker on the team that's for sure he he doesn't not only the best dunker he's our best shooter too so he's our pure shooter and our best dunker so he's starting to combine those skill sets together and it's all coming to play out on the court and it's beautiful to watch yeah, it's awesome to watch him develop throughout the season because, you know, earlier on in the year we were saying he's not doing enough. He's forcing right. the shots too much. And now we're watching him expand his arsenal, which, you know, is already very well fleshed out. And we're not even the only ones. Obviously, if you got named to the Rising Stars uh, game, even though when mm-hmm. we played, they still honored uh, him and Facundo Campazzo made the Rising Stars team. So I think that was something special that we know we need to you know address because he's actually improving enough to where he's getting in that national recognition so yeah. as fans of course we're watching him and we can see his progression but if you know the whole nba is on notice now yeah and i'm, I'm sure that you know that adds to his chip on his shoulder because he always thought that he was one of the best players in his draft class. He thought he should have went number one and to go further on down the list, uh, you know, it, it's hard for him, but he's proving those, those doubters wrong, you know, just because he was injured doesn't mean he lost any of his ability or his athleticism. No, he felt, he felt to what, like 14, I think it was. Yeah. And that was, really great thing for us because we had the yeah. <laughs> to where we could we could bench him for you know we can put him on the shelf let him get his back healed and then now we have the third member of our three-headed monster and mm-hmm. i think that he's definitely proving that he deserves to be one in the starting lineup and two involved in the conversation with murray and Jokic for the stars on the team like there's no doubt about it that he is part of the future like there they is going to be a true big three and uh, the players as of late shows that like they are starting to become so consistent that we're only depending on our role players to play their roles and mm-hmm. we were kind of expecting more out of certain players that really didn't have it so now you can have a stat line like uh, Facundo Campazzo he has three points in that game three rebounds six assists one steal one block that's mm-hmm. those are don't jump off the page actually, I mean that's just like not solid. great numbers but it's it's what you need from a role player right. you know a you're not player, forcing yeah. him into the position to have to score a ton or have to mm-hmm. you know find every pass rebound even I mean Facundo's never going to get those rebounds more yeah but he, but he plays those passing lanes and he gets those steals and six assists I mean that's that's contribution right there mm-hmm. and you have like just little stat lines like that that add up to make a great team. So I think uh, with the rotation that's being shored up, we're looking at what our, our playoff rotation is going to be like even. So uh, yeah. I think we know that Najee's a baller. We know that RJ Hampton's a baller. PJ Dozer coming back uh, has definitely helped us out a lot. So, I mean, we we have injuries and we're still on a four game winning streak. So yeah, I think that we're starting to show our depth. We're starting to show our youth. We're starting to show that we are that team that made it to the Western Conference Finals last year. And it really starts with little little stat lines like that. Composo, only three points. Oh, wow. But six assists, still a block. Little dude mm-hmm. getting a block. Huh? That's yeah. <laughs> playing basketball, you know. He's flying around the court out there. And that type of energy is infectious. Absolutely. And uh, we ended up winning the game because of all of that 
uh, role playing and our starters doing their jobs, everything. Well, we won the game because Jamal Murray said it's my birthday and I'm not going to lose. So if you watch him in the fourth quarter, he turned something on and we did not lose because of Jamal Murray. When I was watching it, I I knew I was going to talk about it in today's mm-hmm. podcast because yeah. he put the team on his back on that one. Like it was a team effort up to the fourth, the, the last five minutes of the fourth quarter. And then it was mm-hmm. Jamal Murray's time. It's time feed the hot hand. And I think that Malone and the, the Nuggets did a really good job of getting Jamal Murray in situations to where he could keep taking the game over. His hand was a hot hand and they kept feeding him and feeding him and he did not disappoint. Like they were coming back. It was a very close game. Dame started to heat up. There were moments where they were trading threes, but Mm -hmm. at the end of the day, it was Jamal Murray who was the hotter hand. And, uh, and that's why we won the game. Yeah. Oh, I, I have to agree. It's something about this Damian Lillard and Jamal Murray sort of rivalry that makes these games so interesting because right. they, they both try to play up to their competition rather than playing down. And you love to watch, especially when it's playoff time. That's what I kind of felt like was that playoff intensity and mm-hmm. and uh, watching them battle it out. I was like, oh, yeah, this is this is what we need because Jamal Murray's confidence uh, we were talking about before, it didn't seem like it it's where it should be at this stage of the season. Mm -hmm. But now I'm starting to see it. He's a late starter. So fourth quarters, watch out for Jamal Murray because he's going to hit some clutch shots. The more difficult, the better for some reason. You leave him wide open, he's hesitant to shoot it. But if you got a hand in his face, maybe even two hands in his face, he's like, oh, yeah, I feel way more comfortable taking this shot. And it makes him a lot of the time. It's definitely interesting how how he's able to – just shoot beyond defense. He doesn't really take that into account when he's really feeling his shot. He just he just lets it fly, and usually it works out for him. So, yeah, when he's shooting like with that kind of confidence, that's that's the Nuggets basketball that we need because he hasn't really been the threat that most people view him as. So mm-hmm. when he starts to to dominate like that, and you got Jokic putting up forty one points, carrying mm-hmm. him to that point, we just need a closer, and that's kind of what our thing has been all season. We don't really close games that well because Jokic yeah. is probably gassed out by then. He's putting the team on his oh, back absolutely. for three solid quarters. He needed some someone to help him out in the fourth, and and now Murray's starting to play that finisher role, and uh, you know Jokic just is pitching eight innings, and then we're bringing in Murray for that that ninth inning closer, and mm-hmm. and he's doing the job, and, and that's what I want to see. That's definitely that uh, complimentary basketball, the two man game that that got us really highly ranked and got us far in the playoffs last year. Very deep into the playoffs. The Western Very Conference deep. Finals, man. Right. That's, right, that's right. as deep as you can go without going to the top. So, yeah, But those are those little things that are starting to come together that we addressed last time. Uh, I know I mentioned that. I know we're going to start moving up in the rankings. I know we're going to make the playoffs. I think this is this is the time. Like, well, now we're starting to see those things. We're starting to see it click. We're starting to hit shots. We're starting to hold yeah. opponents to less three-point – shooting uh even in the hawks game we held them to 35 percent from the three-point line even though we lost yeah. that's a respectable number absolutely uh, i mean that's something that's going to be a consistent theme over the next few games that we talk about the opponent's three-point percentage which is one thing that we highlighted earlier in the mm-hmm. season is one of the major issues of our uh, our team defensively was our perimeter defense so seeing a string together games of less than 40 percent shooting for the other team is a sign that our perimeter defense is, is definitely at the top form where it needs to be for the season. And, it, and it, if it continues like that, we should have win a lot more games. Yeah. And th- that, that is a huge hole in our game that we are starting to address. It's the defensive aspect, but it, going into this streak, as we're moving forward, uh, we're, we're seeing our defense really show up on, on these games and force teams into really bad percentage shooting from all across the court, even, but especially from the three point line. Um, so we, we did get that good victory. Thanks to, as you say, Jamal Murray showing up against the yeah, put it in those finishing antics. Uh, before we move on to the next game, I do want to mention uh, we made history with that game with one turnover uh, we only, oh, had we only had one turnover. We only had one turnover in the no whole game, way. and it's the only time it's ever happened in NBA history. So we just keep making history. Yeah. Uh, so, but moving on to the next game, we followed that up with 18 turnovers. Yeah. So we set we set an NBA record with one turnover <laughs> in a whole game, and then just to follow that up with an 18 turnover performance in the very very next game, uh, it speaks to the inconsistencies that we address 
um, about the team a lot. It's that it's that rule of averages that you talk about all yeah. the time. It yeah. has to balance out at the end. So right you know, from one to eighteen, and yeah, you think that those eighteen turnovers were the reason that we lost this by two points? We could easily got those last two points. So this game was really good, really good game against a team that is surprising was surprisingly playing great basketball at the time. Mm-hmm. They had won four of their five leading into the game. Uh, they had Bradley Bill, who's leading the league in scoring, an absolute stud. Russell Westbrook, who's a triple double machine, who actually got a triple double in the game. Yep. So there, there wasn't a game that we should have won just on paper. It's going to be a good game, and it was that. It was a very back and forth game. Um, I think the 18 turnovers had a huge impact on the game. I also think that um, Compazzo and Barton going one from 12 for downtown was yeah. definitely a huge impact on the game. And um, Jamal Murray's final uh, decision making in the final play was definitely what lost us the game, though, because it was it was uh, an opportunity for us to tie or to go up with the win. And I feel like we made interesting decisions with the final five seconds. So uh, not only did we have two timeouts, it could have drawn up a play. I'm OK with pushing the fast break because we had numbers. But nobody cut to the basket, including Jamal Murray. So if yeah. he would have forced the issue and cut to the basket, he probably would have had someone at the three-point line for an uncontested three or maybe even Michael Porter Jr. slashing to the basket for probably a vicious dunk to tie it up and send us into overtime. So we got what we wanted. We got a defensive stop. We had five seconds left. We had the ball in our scorer's hands. He was playing very good uh, offensively in the fourth. He, he looked like he wanted to win us the game again. Uh, but he made a really yep. bad decision, and he passed it to Compazzo with like a second left, which Compazzo is not our worst three-point shooter, but he's not who I want taking yeah. a buzzer beater yeah. when he pass up. You pass up a Will Barton who might have a better chance. You could have thrown it to J- uh, Michael Porter Jr. in the corner who could, probably would have buried that thing and gave us a one-point lead for the win, mm-hmm. but he passed it to Compazzo, and yeah. nobody cut to the basket. So and it was just we like, love Facundo, it, but I love him. Love the guy, but when you're going, when you shoot one, for, so at that point he's one for six from three. I don't want the ball in his hands yeah. for the potential game winner. I'm yeah. sorry, but uh, yeah, it was just it was an interesting way to lose that game when we had two timeouts. We could have burned one easily and set up a play and gave it to Jokic for if we only needed two points to tie. You know how clutch Jokic is. Yeah, he'll hit that any day. He's gonna go get that shot, and we can go into overtime. And then Murray was cooking. Murray was heating up, so I think if this game goes into overtime, we win it. But we didn't give ourselves that opportunity, and I understand the logic of pushing it on fast break when we have numbers. We have mm-hmm. five seconds left, and it's and it's in Jamal Murray's hands. We have like a four on two. Sure, I get it. I get it. But the execution was terrible, and yeah. if it's me, I'm going to take that five seconds to get my team in the best possible play. No confusion at all. I'm going to call that timeout. Make sure nobody advanced it so I get the ball on the side out, you know, do some high pick and roll action with Jamal Murray and Nikola Jokic. Nikola Jokic probably end up taking the last shot. I'm okay with that. Yeah, that works. But Compazzo shooting a last a buzzer beater three, it yeah. just I, it's not that's not how you win games. It's not smart decision making. Yeah. Uh, you don't want to give it to regardless of being twenty nine years old, he's still a rookie. And uh right. He's not necessarily going to be the clutchest shooter. So, yeah, I'd say it, that just came down to flustered Jamal Murray right. not knowing exactly what to do in that moment. And he owned up to it. He uh, he took blame for that for that loss. And mm-hmm. I, I respect that because, I mean, sure, games don't, don't come down to only one play, but that one play could have tied or won us the game. So, you know, if we're nitpicking yeah. and, he, and he owned up for it, then I have no problem placing the blame on his shoulders either yeah. because – I don't like how he stopped the three point line when he should have forced the issues. He should have collapsed. There. He should have collapsed the paint and either try to get a foul call or dish it out to an open teammate for a, a higher percentage shot. I just, I just don't like yeah. the execution in that last five seconds. And it's a shame because Jamal Murray was having a hell of a fourth quarter. He was. He balling. really was. Yeah, he had a great game and generally was the his thirty four points in the entire game. He could have definitely carried us into an overtime victory if he had just made the right decisions but anyway uh we we have a comment we haven't had these in a, in about a month yeah michael so, so I'm, I'm pleasantly surprised mr ronnie nelson saying that the nuggets are finally 
looking like the team from the bubble. I'd have to agree with that, Mr. Ani. And um, they they need help finishing games. Who is going to be that killer? Who can we look for in the trade deadline? Oof, that's a tough one. Yeah, it is. I don't think there's really – we shored up our perimeter defense, so now we would have to focus on the interior defense. And the game, like the mm-hmm. Hawks game, was a perfect example of how we don't have that shored up. Uh, yeah. They dominated the paint, and we need – if we do go out for a trade, it's, some, it's basically along the lines of what we've been saying. We need a big guy. And, like, there's there were options. I think I mentioned Andre Drummond, but, I mean, it wasn't really mm-hmm. a realistic option because his contract is definitely yeah. massive for anything we could absorb. Big. Yeah, so, and then Blake Griffin, his buyout, but I mean, he hasn't been the same since he's been injury prone. Uh, even though he's a free agent, we really re- have to trade for him. But I mean, I just don't see a, a lot of assets that we have that we could obtain a guy that's going to make that huge of a difference in the paint. We're pretty much set with what we got, and we're going to have to make the run with this. Yeah, I when when I think about who we can trade for, there's no like real feasible options like financially and and skill set wise. Like we we have a team here, and the only issue is that they defensively in the paint don't know exactly what they're doing. So I, it's not for lack of trying. I think it's just lack of execution, and what we need is that to be a focal point going forward is the defense. Uh, we, we always lack on the defense. The, the games that we play in are usually shootouts, you know, 115, 120 points, not really uh, a defensive struggle with a bunch of blocks and a bunch of steals, but uh, it's usually just who can, you know, get more points in the allotted time. And what we need is, somebody to shore up on defense i'm looking to michael porter jr honestly he seems like the best interior defender that we have as i said he has a block a game on average and that's more than anybody does on our team this season on last season as well so he's looking to be defensively sound i think we're kind of committing to the small ball so uh he he goes from three to four and like you said he's He's long, he's rangy, he's our, our, a good defender in the paint, and he's getting those blocks. So uh, he's doing everything that's asked of him. He's grabbing rebounds, he's contesting shots, he's molding into a star player. So if if he can finish putting those touches on that defensive aspect of it, then that's might be the key component. Like we might not need any any addition at all. We just need our players to develop. Yeah. And, you know, Michael Porter Jr. is one of those guys that has developed at a massive rate even just this season. We've seen him improve his his mentality and his skill set in general on the floor. Absolutely. It feels like a game-to-game basis. You can see that he's getting a lot more comfortable. His IQ is getting higher. Uh, He's putting himself in better positions to not only score the ball, but to defend the ball, rebound the ball. And Mm -hmm. uh, he's even getting an assist or two. You know, don't let him add that to his arsenal. Yeah, uh, he's, uh, he, can, he can finish at the rim. He, he's a mid-range bucket. He can finish at three. Uh, once he starts demanding a double team and he starts learning how to find the open man, like it, it's going to yeah. be scary for the he's rest the, of the NBA. He'll be the whole package. Absolutely, he'll be that <laughs> that third head on the the dog on the, on the hydra yeah. on the uh, Cerberus. Cerberus, yes, indeed, <laughs> that guy. So uh, thank you very much, Ronnie. I I know we didn't really answer your question because we don't know who they could really add, but we appreciate your engagement nonetheless. Um, And yeah, I guess we'll close up on the Washington segment. Was there anything else you wanted to say about that game? Uh, There's just another, like, what is his name? Hachimura? Yeah. Like 20 points on us. Like we, we need to stop make a living off of making names for other people. Yeah. We need to go out there and be dominant and, and shut people down. We can't let people get confident on us. Like I feel like the Celtics really got confident off of playing us a few weeks ago. Cause now they're playing tremendous ball. Mm-hmm. And I feel like that's right off of our backs. And I do not like that. I would, I would feel su- extremely disrespected as a team. If other teams in the league thought that I was a stepping stone. Yeah. So I think that they, they need to really take these matchups seriously and um, I think one of the biggest takeaways from this game was the our big three, 
they had 76 combined points, 27 combined rebounds, and 14 combined assists. Yeah. That is the formation of the future right there. Absolutely. So, even though it was a loss, I I seen a lot of good that came yeah. up from that game. Even a lot yeah. of bright bright points to really bring forward into the future. We saw, I mean, they all shot excellent percentages. They all right. found the right man and, and found the right play. Uh, Jokic and Michael Porter both getting 10 plus rebounds, right. which is a huge statistic. A lot of people don't put weight into rebounds, but if you're out rebounding, you're out possessing the other team. And the more you have right. the ball, the more you score the ball. And and he's, he's turning into to a perennial 2010 guy. Yeah, mm -hmm. if you can go get twenty points and ten rebounds, you have a job in this league forever. Yeah, yeah you're gonna Absolutely. always have. Uh, Tim Duncan always, was uh, that man. There's there's hundreds yeah. of them. That, right, that you know, just all you have to do is get the points, get the rebounds, and make sure you're passing to the ball handler. And and that's it. You ain't expected to do anything else. Go get us 20 and 10, and we'll go get 20, 10, and 10 from Jokic, and then probably go get 20, 25, and 5 from Murray. Mm -hmm. We don't need much else from the other players. Like, they're yeah. truly role players at that point. We don't really need anybody else to step up. We have our three, three-headed three monster, seriously. Yep, and it's it's just a matter of chemistry and time that that three-headed monster comes and bites the head off of the West Division. It's yes, going to be yeah, awesome, man. Yeah, I cannot wait. I'm seeing it. I'm seeing it happen right before our eyes. Yeah, absolutely. If the Suns can, if the Suns can make that type of rise through the Western Conference, yeah. I, there's no reason that we shouldn't be able to. I mean, the Suns are good this season. They really the are. Have, they have, have better leadership, but they don't really have anything that we don't, you know? Yeah. Uh, well, they so, have DeAndre Ayton, who is defensively a lot better than – that is true. Nikola that is Jokic. True. I, Jokic. I I just Jokic. feel like you need you yeah. need both ends. Jokic is the best offensive center in the league, in my opinion. But right. when it comes to defense, a center is a cornerstone of defense, particularly. They're, protector. They're supposed yeah. to protect the rim for sure. So when you lose that sort of aspect, you have to throw it onto your other guys. And that's why defensively inside we can't really do too much because you know, we got a, we got our main scorer out working on the offensive end most of the time. Right. But anyway, uh, moving forward from the Washington game, which we unfortunately lost by two points, basically in the last five seconds of that game. Agreed. Um, we will go forward to a huge route by the Nuggets at Oklahoma City. Uh, we won 126 to 96. And this is a team that like no disrespect to them. They just don't have it. They don't have it this season. They, well, they, they're an example of what happens if you lose veteran leadership. So mm -hmm. having Chris Paul on their team, they were competitors and taking that one component off the team goes to show you that you need it. You need that veteran leadership and mm -hmm. they are a prime example of it. And this route was truly that it was from start to finish. We never trailed. Uh, it was a true definition of a blowout. They gave up in the first quarter. I have never seen a game mm -hmm. won in the first quarter, but I watched it lost in the first quarter in that game. And yeah. they, there was no coming back from it from a mental or physical standpoint. They were just done. Like they threw in the towel. There is a mercy rule. Then it probably would have been applied in the first half. They were, it was so one sided that it looked like we were playing a college team at one point. Yeah, it was, it was truly a story of men versus boys. Uh, the <laughs> oldest player was like one of the oldest players in the league on OKC's team and Al Horford. So, you know, you could call him a veteran, but you couldn't necessarily call him a leader. He, he's more of a role player and he doesn't have, he hasn't been that key piece for really any team to. Right. He hasn't been a 2010 next. guy in years. Yeah. You know? It's been at least like four seasons that we've seen him actually put up excellent numbers and he had a rough night tonight um, or that night. And basically their whole team had a rough night. The best, the best player that they had was Darius Baisley, who, you know, he, he he's kind of new to this whole thing, but he's, he's proven himself to be a decent scorer. And honestly, one of the more consistent scorers for the thunder. He plays well against us for sure, mm -hmm. but there was, they would have needed a whole team of him because yeah. <laughs> we we had their number from the start. Uh, the Our three-headed monster, our Cerberus, had 
65 combined points. Michael Porter Jr. had 20 points, 10 rebounds. Like we were saying, he needs him to do. Nicole Jokic dropped a triple-double. And then Jamal Murray scored um, at least 24 points for the fourth consecutive game. Uh, it's just looking consistent, looking like something to be feared, something yeah. that coaches have to game plan for. It's not just Jokic, not just Murray or Michael Porter Jr. It's all three of them. If you're not honest, if you're not playing good defense on any one of them, they have, they can, they have the ability to score. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, but that's our thing is we, we are not scaring people defensively. We have to go out there and outscore people. We have to run them off the court. And I think that's how we've been playing as of late. And it's been making us successful. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. But this game was sort of a, an anomaly in that sense where we managed to play good defense or they just played poor offense where they were only shooting 42% for the entire game. You know, we, we may not have defended them excellently, but we held them to 96 points. We it didn't ever become a shootout because we basically ended the game in the first quarter, as you said, 38 points right. in the first quarter. We took and their, their will to play. Mm -hmm. And the that's, that's where the veteran leadership comes in is, you know, you have a really rough first quarter, you're down 18 after 12 minutes, you know, it's kind of hard to come back from that unless you have the, the killer mentality that veterans right. come with. Yeah, it's not impossible. It's just having somebody there to calm the team down. And if, if it's me and I'm on the Thunder team and I've done my homework on the Nuggets, mm -hmm. I'm going to tell the team, all right, they do that. They go off on the first quarter. This mm -hmm. is where we make a chance to come back because they are notorious for falling off in the second quarter. You know, that's where that type of, of leadership will come in. If somebody that steps in and say, hey, guys, all right, cool. We just got punched in the mouth in the first quarter. First quarter. They are notorious for dropping the ball in the second. So let's go in there and let's put the pressure on their second string and, and make our comeback there and then chip away, maybe be down by eight points going into the second half. That's extremely manageable. But if, if you don't view it like that and you're like, Oh my gosh, they just put up 38. They're going to do it again. We're going to be down by 36 mm. at the half. Well then, yeah, that's probably what's going to happen to you. And like you said about mentality, you have to have somebody there that's helping them shape that mentality because um, the man who says he can and the man who says he can are both right. Dang, Michael, you hit me with that philosophy. You I like that? It. Yeah, man. Yeah, honestly, <laughs> honestly, the Thunder should just sign you up because you got that mentality already. You're you're a veteran in the mental game. <laughs> I would have been able to uh, help them out from a, a mental toughness aspect for sure. Because you know, there's no way I'm gonna let my team lose in the in the first half. No way. Yeah, yeah, it, and they definitely just lost all semblance of hope. It, it made it an easy game. And I, I think that's kind of what coach Malone wants when we get these big old scoring first quarters is he wants to break their mentality. And unfortunately, you know, it works sometimes against these younger teams, but other times the veterans are going to find their way back in, you know, they're going to use their experience and figure out how Absolutely. to come back. I actually I was, was – it was a great game to watch as a fan because when you see us go off in the first quarter, you, I, I kind of get nervous. Like, mm -hmm. oh, man, we're going to play horrible the rest of the game because we hadn't really strung solid performances together uh, four quarters. And this was one of the games where we actually played four quarters. And yeah. um, the mentality was there the whole game. The, the effort, the energy was there the whole game. The starters really set the tone. There wasn't a starter that had less than plus 27 in the plus or minus. So uh, – they came out, they put their foot on, on the gas, and they didn't let up. And I think that's been one of my biggest criticisms of, of Coach Malone is that when he gets big leads, they let off and allow teams to come back. So I was saying that he didn't have that killer instinct, that killer mentality, but they showed it there. They didn't let up. Like, I don't care who this team is, and that's kind of how it needs to go. They should be able to blow out any team, mm -hmm. not on an every-night basis, but there shouldn't be a team in the NBA that – is that the Nuggets shouldn't be able to just blow out on, on, on a night. If we come out and we're on our best and they're not, we should be able to really be putting a hurting, a hurting on teams just like this and consistently and put it on them through the whole game. It, uh, it was really good as a fan to watch because I've seen us blow leads. I've seen us start hot and then just mm -hmm. fizzle straight out and end up losing by double digits. We so, both seen it, man. We know it's I, a I hate problem. it. But to, to go up by 18 and, if, and win by 30, that's, that's a, a huge sign that, that the mentality is there. They're mm -hmm. not letting up. They're not feeling sorry for people because you shouldn't. 
They're getting yeah. paid just like you to do their job. And if they can't stop you, that's on them. That's mm-hmm. on that's their problem that I have to deal with. And I don't really feel like we've played like that all year. I feel like we let up and we let teams in, into games that we shouldn't, that they should never be in. Yeah. And, and uh, in the words of somebody else, F those kids, bro. You don't need to <laughs> let them back into this. Um, so looks like we have another comment from Ronnie Nelson Hi again, gang. What's the update on our injured players, Harris and Millsap? Uh, uh, I don't Michael have... on that list as well. Oh, did Jermichael get injured too? Yeah, so we've, we've been playing with all three of them. Yeah, um, man. So Harris has an abductor strain in his quad, so he'll probably be out for like another week or so. Uh, Millsap, I actually am not current on his situation, and then uh, Jermichael Green had a shoulder strain. That was hindering his progress, but he, Jermichael Green's probably the closest to returning, um, and I'm not sure on Millsap's position. And then Harris will probably be out for a little longer. But if you noticed that those injuries helped us eliminate some of Coach Malone's stubbornness, yeah. because we know that Paul Millsap is probably not a starter in this league anymore, mm-hmm. and Gary Harris was questionable at best. So seeing Monte Morris in the starting lineup has actually been helping us. So um, Malone was forced to be a good coach in that situation. <laughs> yeah. He was forced, <laughs> he was forced to adapt and find different ways. And sometimes, you know, the experimentation yields results and that result is what, what did we win five of the last seven or was it four of the last seven? I mean, we won five of the last seven, we won four in a row. So, yeah. I mean, I'm not saying that these dudes are making us lose games, but I was sure that they're helping us win games. You know, <laughs> yeah. I like the lineup that we've been we're running with, and it kind of makes me feel like we would be fine without Harris and or Millsap. Yeah, um, certainly it works, man. It just works, and there's no point in changing it up so much if if it's working right now. I mean, we, we won games with an eight-person rotation, you know, the, that's right. not very typical, but it shows that our starters are excellent and you know our bench shows up when they need to. We can we can make it work despite some of the biggest names on the roster, some of the highest uh salaries on the roster being out. Right. But it's just showing some of the some of our younger guys, uh like Najee, he's he's played pretty consistent off the bench and mm-hmm. Compazzo, he's definitely been one of the best contributions to the team it allows monte morris to start and we still get assists um, from that second string so i'm looking at our depth and um we look better than i thought we would if we were missing key pieces but i think that also just goes to show that we can live without harris and and milso yeah we make do we make do when we have to and we've made quite a bit of do here right so. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, thank you again, Ronnie, for that. Oh, he left another one. Here we go. Then you're seeing possible trades. You got to give up someone, right? If we could get rid of Paul Millsap for somebody that makes as much money as him but does more, uh, we would do it any day. I think the issue is that Paul is on a huge contract for being – you know, a basic role player. So nobody really wants to take on that kind of money because they're not getting enough. We don't have no trade assets. We don't have. Yeah. Yeah. Like them being out of the lineup and us getting better doesn't help their value for trading. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, uh, I mean, I just don't see anybody like clamoring for Paul Millsap, maybe Gary Harris. There's a need. There's always a need for a perimeter defender yeah. in this league. So, um, and he hasn't played the worst this year. So, I think if we were to trade anybody, it'd be uh, Harris or Barton, one of those two, uh, because Barton's just been still so wildly inconsistent. But I think our payoff, we we'd probably get somebody small. Any trade I see realistically happening, we probably get another score, probably get another yeah. point guard or shooting guard or small forward. Like, there's not really any realistic trade scenarios where we bring in a dominant power forward. Yeah. Someone we that's going to like change the entire yeah. way we play someone that takes right. over a game. We I, just I don't, don't have the assets. Yeah. Yeah, we'd have to, we'd have to trade a bunch of people or maybe even somebody that we didn't want to trade like a Michael Porter jr. Type or something yeah. just to be able to get a quality player in. Like we'd basically be trading 
apples for apples. Yeah. It wouldn't wouldn't really make our team better. So I I think there's no way to trade to upgrade our yeah. positions right now. So there you go, Ronnie. Uh, we addressed your questions. I, and maybe you could leave a suggestion on what you would do. But to us, there's really not a lot of value in, you know, messing up the chemistry some more when we're finally getting it to start click. And uh, we'd have to give up like a, like three, at least three players just to get, dump the salary enough to get a decent enough player yeah. to cover their salary. Yeah. So if we wanted an Andre Drummond type, we'd have to trade Gary Harris, Will Barton, and somebody else just to make the room for him. Yeah. So it's just, yeah, I don't. It's a, it's a rough position. Anyway, uh, Ronnie says, all we need is to believe in our team. Our time is coming. And I agree with you 100%, <laughs> Ronnie. We just I did need see to that we in. are expressing interest in uh, P.J. Tucker from the Rockets. But like, like I was saying, most the what interest that we're do? in, shoot threes, D and three, that's it. Yeah. Like, like we're not like, like uh, we're not upgrading any positions at this point. We just need to keep the chemistry that we have going and and just roll with that. Honestly. All right. Yeah, we got to buy into the game plan, <laughs> buy into the process, and uh, we're with you on that one, Ronnie. All right, and uh, I, I guess we'll wrap up the OKC game. Is there anything else you want to say about that? Uh, no, those OKC game was just was just a blowout. Yep, blowout, and we showed killer mentality for an entire 48 minutes, which is something to yeah. be said. Um, moving forward, we had a game in Chicago against the Bulls, which we won 118 to 112. And uh, what, what do you have to say about this game? I, I think this went pretty well for us. It was a scary moment because we were up big for most of the game, mm -hmm. and um, they came back in that third quarter – and they made it close, and then they ended up taking the lead in the in the fourth quarter. So, like, they made a comeback. They played us really hard, and we were blowing them out. We got off to a really hot start, and we let off, like we was talking about. Like, we couldn't put them to bed like we did with the Thunder. Honestly, we could have beat them by close to just as much, maybe even yeah. 20, po 20 points. But, no, we only, we only won by six. And honestly, that was a little too close for comfort. But there, there was lead changes that shouldn't have been lead changes. We let we allowed them to come back, but. We found a way to win, which is something that I can't say for a lot of the games this season. So I think that's really the saving grace or the silver lining was the fact that we found the way to win, but we almost found a way to lose that game. And it was definitely terrifying to watch. I, my heart was racing. I was like, please do not lose this game. Yeah. Please do not lose this game. Yeah, my friend's it's, a, a it's Bulls so fan, hard and to I watch. Couldn't, I couldn't hear it. I couldn't hear his mouth if, if we lost that game. So I'll say those Bulls fans can be definitely obnoxious. They're still coasting off of Michael Jordan. Right, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> the, anytime they get a win. And, and D. Rose. Uh, but – yeah, I, I'd have to agree with you. It it was tight towards the end. I, I just I felt like we always had it in the bag. It was just like a matter of shoring up the defense, keeping Kobe from shooting, keeping the the scorers from scoring in general because they just wanted to chip away at every little lead that we had. And we don't necessarily hold on to those well, but we did – managed to defend well. We kept them at around 45% field goal percentage. Yeah, which Held them at 31% from the three-point line. So yeah. yeah, more perimeter, perimeter defense. defense. Right, yes. We've been harping on it. And I think that had a lot to do with P.J. Dozer returning uh, in the Thunder game. So he got a lot, he got more minutes in this game, and his defensive prowess is definitely something that we were missing. Yeah. Uh, so there was definitely yeah. a PJ uh, Dozier sighting, but Michael Porter Jr. seventeen points, fifteen rebounds, one assist, one steal, one block. What we need from him, right That's there. That is need. solid stat line. That is the stat line of a young man who is playing his game, and it is it is awesome to watch. But um, the big three combined for eighty points that game. Yeah, eighty points. That's so this what's is up. How I envision us winning a lot of games. Uh, it's going to be a lot of the, the three-headed monster and then a little bit from the role players. We're not going to really blow out a lot of teams like the Thunder game. I'm expecting games just like this, big three going, putting up most of our points, and then we win close games. Yeah, uh, I, I'm of a similar mind. I think once these three really start to get consistent, because that's our biggest issue is the inconsistencies, but – 
if we can get, you know, 70, 80 points out of these three guys every night, then that leaves very little for our bench to have to accomplish. And, you know, we, we saw it, we saw it that night. Jokic went for 39 again, and we actually got the win this time. So right. that's important. You know, it's not just Jokic putting it all on his shoulders. He's spreading the ball. He had the nine assists. He was only one assist away. From the from TD, the from that triple double. double. Yeah, so, he's a machine. Yeah, he, you know, when he's on the floor, he's a danger, but he's more than just a scoring threat. He's, he will find everything. There's really nothing that'll get by him. And he makes, he's, it just feels like he makes every shot that he takes. Right. It, you sure. know, it says 17 for 28. It felt like for 28 for 28. You see him just especially make those... in that second half, man. He started, he started, he carried us in that fourth, fourth quarter. I think he scored mm -hmm. like 12 or 14 straight points for us. Yeah. And it was like, he kept us in the game when it was supposed to get out of hand. They were just making their run. They had just taken their first lead. And he was like, nah, I'm not losing this game. So he, <laughs> he took today. a page out of Jamal Murray's book and uh, he took over that game in the fourth quarter. It was a huge reason why we won it. But I mean, the role players, they helped out a lot. Um, just in the little things, but now Jamal Murray, six straight game with uh, at least 24 points, and he's just really doing his thing. Doing uh, Jokic, Jokic dunked on Patrick Williams. He caught a body <laughs> that night. <laughs> uh, and we had Michael Porter Jr. putting back dunks, you know what I'm saying, getting offensive rebounds. Using that athletic – Right. Athletic. He had two he had two athletic putbacks and mm -hmm. it was just like watching this aspect of Michael Borner Jr. has just been so refreshing just mm -hmm. to see, like you said, how fast he's progressing through through the season, like game to game. He's definitely adding a new layer to his game. So come playoff time, he might even be the complete package. Uh, he might it's, be. Wouldn't that be exciting? Like, he, yes, man, we need it. <laughs> a complete package, Michael Porter Jr., a lights-out Jamal Murray, and a triple-double machine, Nikola Jokic. I mean, that That's, sounds like a recipe for success. That is a recipe for success, man. I can't, I can't see a lot of teams holding up to when all of our guys are clicking on every point. So it, it'll be awesome to see, especially in the postseason when, you know, basketball just gets even more intense and everybody just plays better for some reason. Uh, it, it'll be something to see because I, I think we do have a recipe for success with this team. Yes, I'm getting uh, happy, man. You know, I think we, we, we've called some of this. Like, we, we spotted some of this early, and now yeah. it's happening. I mean, kind of look well, like – Well, no, y'all were talking about trading Gary Harris and saying I we don't say have we what it takes. trade Gary <laughs> Harris. <laughs> but we started off in a whole different place because our team was not doing this well. But the and, biggest uh, difference is the uh, playing the younger guys, which we said that he should do more. So I think the, a lot of the success is coming from playing the younger guys, which wasn't happening because he was overplaying the Gary Harris's and the Paul Millsaps. Mm -hmm. So like now that they're getting their opportunity to shine, now we're playing complimentary basketball. Now this, the bench players are keeping leads or at least, you know, maintaining a high enough lead to where the, the starters can come in and, crank it back up to double digits and things of that nature. Like when we, when we play like that, when our whole team goes positive, like that, that's hard to beat. That Absolutely. is hard to beat. And Let we me, did uh, in the, in the Bucks game, a whole, our whole team went positive. Oh, okay. We're going on to the Bucks game, which was a, another freaking massive victory. I loved yeah. watching that. Start uh, to finish. Giannis. I mean, he still had a great game, but he couldn't do much with, without his team and they didn't really show tonight, but, but 31 points against a 21 and 13 team, you know, it was a statement of victory for sure. Yeah. Uh, we definitely showed them that we are actually a deeper team than the Bucks because Giannis, like you said, he didn't have a bad game and Middleton dropped 22. Mm -hmm. So 20 as well. He dropped 20 points. 20. So <laughs> I was like, he didn't drop 20 as well. <laughs> <laughs> so 20 as well. So looking at it from that perspective, their stars didn't play bad. They just goes to show you that their role players just aren't as good as ours. They don't have even a third option. I mean, they have Drew, Drew Holiday, but uh, where was he at? You know what I mean? So yeah, he they did don't not have show up that day. No, nah, and we did. We showed up and we we put in work and we put up 71 points with our big three, our three-headed monster. Just floating around that 60 to 80 points between all three of them, that is solid contributions. That means they are all averaging at least 20 points. So that's, you know, 
that's how you win games. You have three people in their starting lineup that average at least 20 points. That goes to show you that we are scoring threats. We can score on anybody, and even against a tough defensive team like the Bucks. Yeah, and and the defensive momentum was with us as well. We kept them to really terrible shooting stats. They shot forty and a half percent, just general field goals, and twenty. That's not even the worst. Yeah, like that's not the way. That's the three point one is where I like that yeah. twenty seven and a half percent from three is like. Man, wh- where was this at the beginning of the year? So if yeah. you look at the numbers, they're dropping from the high 30s to now the low 30s to now the high 20 percentages from three-point line. Like that is mm-hmm. progression. I don't know if it's coaching or if it's execution, but we are starting to lock down that perimeter. So if we could just get that mid-range and that paint secured, we'll, we'll be an offensive and defensive-minded mate- uh, team. And We'll be machines at that point. Like, who would want to go against that? We'll be we'll be blowing out a lot of teams by thirty points. Uh, that's how we got there. We're playing offense and defense, not just a little bit of one or the mm-hmm. other. And we, and we did another four quarter game. Yeah, we put together a four quarter performance, and you know these dudes are favored probably to win the East or at least be up there in the Eastern Conference Finals. <clears throat> and we beat them pretty handily. There wasn't a point where we trailed in this game, and. Uh, Tory Tory Craig, 0 for 2 from 3. So all that little cute gimmicky uh, stuff that I was working uh, last time. Nah, oh, man, we shut all that down. Not today. Not no, today. Not today. Uh, it was a, definitely a huge statement win. Uh, I kind of felt like it was a revenge game from the, the last time we played them because mm-hmm. we started off hot and then they kind of figured us out and put it on us, put a hurting on us. And I knew in that game that we shouldn't have lost as bad as we did. So yeah to get an opportunity to have redeemed ourselves so quickly and then to have that type of performance was just great to see from a team's perspective as far as mental toughness is concerned. So you don't look at that team like, man, I'm scared to go against them. They're like, no, I want a piece of them again and Mm -hmm. I can't wait to play them. And then when you, when you can't wait to play somebody and then smack them by 31, yeah, that's, that's mental toughness right there. That's what's up. Yeah. That's, that's that killer mentality. And I think, what that comes down to now is the chemistry finally clicking. You know, we had that huge turnover in the off season and now people are understanding the plays, understanding the rotations and executing them, you know, almost snap like that, you know, figuring out where they're supposed to be and, and, you know, finding their place in the system that the nuggets have right now. No, I totally agree. And it's just, it was just such a hard fought win for us because we were on the road on the second game from a back to back against a, a really good team. I really think they underestimated us. They think, yeah. I think they thought they could coast through this game and that they were just going to dominate us like they did in the first, uh, the last game that we played and that uh, we weren't going to put up much of a fight that we would probably be tired, discouraged, you know, all these things mm-hmm. that all the excuses that we could have made for ourselves. And we did it. We went out there and, and balled out. Bounce back. You're inspiration into me right now, Mike. Yeah, man. Yeah, I, I feel it. Like, mental I stuff. Last, uh, yeah. yeah, mental toughness. And that's a huge part of, of the game, you know, being able to be resilient, being able to bounce back, deal with adversity, because they're not supposed to schedule you on a second night of a back-to-back on an away game. So mm-hmm. it's like, you know, it would. I would see that and I'd be like, wow, somebody hates us. But mm-hmm. at the end of the day, you got to shake it off because you're a professional and you got to go do play it. the game. Just and they did. Go and they and played play, very bro. well. Yep. And they did they an shot. awesome job. Bull Bull got two minutes. I was going to say it. He, he got hit two three. minutes. He, he hit, hit a three. three there was a- <laughs> he, he is statistically the best three-point shooter on the team. He's hitting 50%. Now that may what be – What's the sample size, only, though? I think it's oh. like three of six. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, the numbers are that low. It's it's 50%, all right? You can't knock the man's effort and his efficiency. No, he, there was a bull bull sighting. There was a slender man sighting, and he wet, <laughs> he wetted a three out there in his two minutes of play. It was silky oh. too, I might add. Oh, he he's nice with it, man. If he's flowing, he's got a stroke on that boy. He's just he's he's like a a malnourished gazelle at times. He's, <laughs> he's, he's as good as people uh, think he's going to be, though. Like, just watching him play, he just doesn't have that defensive ability. Like, sure, if yeah. you want to be a stretch five, that's fine. But if he, I don't see him being dominant. In yeah, this. I think if he put maybe like another 40 pounds onto his frame so that it's not just like super 
yeah, he's not long built. muscles <laughs> trying to like carry these three foot long bones. Like he's just yeah. not like muscularly built for how large he is. Right. So, well, I don't. Think, I don't know if his bones will be able to support if you got. I know, bones. man. <laughs> he's a he's an anomaly of a human being. He's built he's so like strange. Dad, yeah, but I mean, his dad could move in in the post and everything. Right. He, he, we'll see. Bobo's still young, man. We'll just <laughs> hope he doesn't blow out his knees or something yeah, like that. I mean, all he's doing is shooting spot up jumpers. I think he'll be fine. Yeah. <laughs> Bro, the shade in that. I felt the energy through the screen. Come on, man. You can't hate on my man Bobo like that. I'm just disappointed because <laughs> I was like one of the main people advocating for Bobo because he was playing great at the end of the year last year. And then he uh, was, yeah. put him on a, we put him on that contract and it's like, where did he go? Like, what happened to the man? We play him the little minutes he does play. He just looks lost on defense. He doesn't look sure of himself. I just I was happy when we signed him, and I'm not sad that we did. Now I'm just like, where where is yeah. where's this talented well, you know, seven footer that we've been hearing so much about? He's a lot better on two K. I'll say that. I'd like to, <laughs> I'd like to get the sure. untapped potential on him. Put him up to like 92. Then he's just a monster everywhere. Yeah, man. I had a <laughs> nugget on my two K, and uh, Jokic was down with an injury, and Bull Bulls just shining. I was like, where is up, bro? Yeah. <laughs> Is this in real life? Yeah, I wish. I wish 2K was anything like real life. Oh, but anyway, uh, we'll move on to the the final game in the seven game stretch that we're covering against the Pacers in Indiana, which we won uh, pretty handily. It wasn't an easy game, but we managed to win by ten points, one thirteen to one hundred three at the end. Actually, yeah, that score doesn't indicate how much we did trounce them. Like it was. Definitely handily, we whooped them. I could say convincingly. Uh, just watching the game, it was. I didn't really feel like it was out of our hands. I knew, like after the first quarter, I was like, "Yeah, we got this one in the bag." I just didn't really feel threatened. They did make a good run, though. They made a run in the third quarter. All every team does. It's a game of runs, but yeah, ultimately we were able to uh, shore up the mental toughness and, and stomp them out, stomp that little fire they were trying to put out. So. <clears throat> Um, I think we played a really solid game, 67 points from our three-headed monster. I mean, right in that range, we need them at 60 to 80. And yep. the time they hit that, it seems to be we're winning games. So if we can continue to keep that going. And um, also we held the Pacers to 39.3% from three-point land. So keeping their three-point percentage under 40 or ours is steadily over 40 uh, that's been helping us out a lot. We've been winning games from that aspect and just rebounding the ball. We're 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 playing a lot more fundamental team basketball mm -hmm. than the beginning of the year. Yeah, absolutely. It's a lot less forced, in my opinion. We're we're putting a lot less emphasis on Nikola Jokic to carry us to the end of these games because the man is, you know, seven foot, two hundred sixty pounds. He can't be running back and forth and doing everything like. He's got right. to rely on his 40 minutes for what is it? 72 games this year. Like, man, that that's, that's too much work. That's load. a lot of work, man. That's a lot of work. And it's kind of incredible. Like he's, he seems so un unathletic and like he, he just kind of walks everywhere, but the man right. is just, he's quick as hell when he wants to be. Right. And, and, the, and the post, his post moves are, are oh, like, dude, that Serbian spin brother, when yeah. he's off on the right and he just he, he chicken wings you and gets you. Yeah. That. yeah. <laughs> There's nothing you can do about it. He spins so quick and he runs yeah. to that rack. Like that's goes, his shot. Yeah. He goes and he puts it, he goes straight to the basket. So spin, boom. And like, it's just, it yeah. happens faster. Like how can that big man move that, that quick? I know. know. It's because he's constantly lulling you to sleep, man. You expect yeah. him to just move <laughs> slow. He and, in bed and then he, then, yeah. then he does it. Then he, he throws the baby out the window. Out the window, dude. Out the window. that's <laughs> right. Rock that baby in the treetop for sure. Yeah. It was it was crazy. And Jamal is still putting up great numbers. Uh, he only had 23 in that game, but that would mark the seventh straight game that he scored yeah, at least. I, not even like it doesn't have to be great numbers. It has to be consistent numbers. That was our issue earlier was, you know, he would take eight shots, 10 shots and only make two or three of them. And that's, that's not what you want. Five to 15 points. And like, you're not, you're, you're a max contract guy. Yeah. I cannot let, I, we can't forget that we're, you're paying you top dollar. We need top performance. You know, yeah, absolutely. So, 
to see him go on that stretch where he's scoring 20 plus 50 percent from three and like almost every game it's that jamal murray that we said that after he got a little bit of rest and got healthy had the potential to be the blue arrow the blue arrow brother Seven. he is making that that late season push to where people know he is a all-star superstar any star he is definitely shooting for the stars because my man is lights out as of late especially in the fourth quarter because if you notice he's doing a lot of slow starts but he'll pick it up late in the game because he he can tell the competitive competitive nature of him jamal murray is one of those nba players that for sure he does not like to lose mm. so, and, I, and you can see it in his performances oh, late in games because he likes to take over and a lot of people want to take over but he's one of the very few people who are capable of doing so so seeing that has been Extremely encouraging. I think last time we were on the podcast, I was saying that I was feeling inspired by his play. Yeah. So to see him stepping up in the way that he is, um, Nicole Jokic being as solid as he always is, two assists away from a triple double. Mm-hmm. Just he's always just one or two away from it too. Right. He's and, so and close every time because it's probably like a miss or two. Like he probably had the open guy, but they yeah. missed. Him. You know what I mean? Yeah. But, we have so many more triple doubles, but people just ain't making their shots, man. Yeah. I be I be talking to him, hey man, needs you to hit that shot so I get that triple double. Come man. on, man, for the stat line, please. For hey, the stat dude, line, that, that's culture. You know what I I'm mean? I'm trying to be MVP this season. You know, come on. If he's not at least in everybody's conversation for MVP, then they're just unbiased, and Denver will never get the respect they deserve as a sporting market because he has played phenomenally. Yeah, uh, I mean, if anybody watches Denver games, they know how different our offense looks with Jokic versus without Jokic. You can see how much he changes everything around him. He he implements himself on that floor, and there's there's no way that he's and that's what an MVP does. You know, they make the team, they make their everybody around them that much better. And I I can honestly say that Jokic definitely puts his teammates in positions for them to be great. And it's all about if they if they hit shots or not, really, at the end of the day. Because mm-hmm. there's sometimes people are, like, almost surprised even at how open he gets them. Like, he's definitely yeah. – he hits he hits Jamal on the on the outside and Jamal looks like a deer in headlights sometimes because he's like I have so much space where's everybody at yeah like you know, <laughs> where's the pressure I'm only allowed to shoot when I'm under pressure yeah I think um, another interesting point to take from this game was that we kind of flipped our our mo and we had a second quarter yeah so, like it was interesting like they must be addressing these things like. Our second quarters are bad, so we need to play better in second quarters. And uh, I don't know if that's what their emphasis was in this game, but if it was, then I'd say they were extremely successful because um, the second quarter is kind of where we pulled away. Yeah, and, um, you know, it, we're playing the full game now, whereas last week we were talking about how how front-heavy our offense is and how we, we put a lot of emphasis into that first quarter scoring. But now we're – we're scoring consistently throughout the three quarters. We're scoring, you know, 25, 30 points in the later quarters. And that's what you need. You need to be able to have offense despite your team, you know, not having the main personnel on the floor. You have to be able to keep the rate up. Uh, coming down to our adjusting to adjustments. Mm-hmm. So I think that um, before we were just getting figured out and then that was it. We're just going with the flow. But now we're, our adjustments are happening at half. They're happening at the quarter. They're happening in game. So uh, it's obvious because if they start to make a run, we do something to stop that run. Now mm-hmm. that's not, I can't say we were doing that. You know, yeah, maybe if, uh, maybe Malone's listening to you, man. He's he needs to. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna put him in the hot seat. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you ought to, man. You ought to. You're putting him to 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 bear. So no, I need a. I need to see. Something from alone this year. I want. I want to, man, because I don't see the defensive mindedness of him, and sometimes I don't see the offensive mind either. So, like, I question what he does great sometimes. You know? <laughs> <laughs> like, I don't think I could do a better job as a coach. Like, I don't know the ins and outs, the nuances. So yeah. it's like it's really easy for me to sit here and have that opinion. But at the same time, it's like, man, they, there's just a lot to question about the guy. Yeah. He hasn't. He hasn't shown too much of his uh, 
so to speak, excellent coaching, as everybody likes to say, but rarely people see. Uh, and you know, we'll, we'll, we'll see. Uh, we're watching. We're watching a pretty good run going on, and it seems like the coaching is starting to get better. We're making adjustments and adjustments to their adjustments as well. And it it looks like we're pretty strong heading forward. What would you say? I would have to agree. I think uh, fitting off of the energy we had from our last podcast, they're kind of actually going with that same flow because they are moving up in the rankings. They are starting to bust together. And I think this is exactly what we predicted that would happen, uh, especially as of the last podcast. They're definitely the chemistry is going to start coming together better. Um, the younger players are starting to get more rotation time and um, the starters are starting to be more productive and more consistent. So it's just happening. We just thought it would happen sooner. So yeah. um, the fact that we're as close as we are to having a 500 record is a little off putting, but at the very same time, we are making strides towards being better and mm -hmm. executing and putting full games together. We're playing, we're playing four quarter nuggets basketball, and that's really all that we could have asked for. Unbeatable. 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 If we're playing the first quarter Nuggets basketball, if it was only the first quarter, you couldn't beat that. But if we're going to bring <laughs> that into every quarter going forward, there's no chance. The Western Division is done for. It's us. You know how we're coming for that top spot in our division and the conference. We're coming. Yeah, our, our perimeter defense – is getting better, Utah. You ain't got a chance against us now. And that's really their that, their biggest thing against us. I mean, Rudy Gobert definitely uh, has some good games, but if we could lock down the perimeter like we have been against Utah, I don't think they could beat Jokic, us. Jokic, Jokic makes Rudy look silly, man. Jokic yeah. makes that man useless in the post. But it's all like I said, it's all about how we defend the pick and roll when we play them. Because when we catch, we play them really well. But when Jokic is in no man's land and Gobert is just catching oops all day long and we're making him look like an all star he's an all star. We're making him look like a superstar, <laughs> then yeah, that's when I start to get a little annoyed because Gobert has the range of like, you know, a urinal and pissing at the urinal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's about as far as he can go. Yeah. yeah. And the fact that if he if he ever puts up twenty points on us, it, it kills me on the inside because he didn't earn it. It was our it was our strategy that gave it. So yeah. we're coming well, we we will be coming for them, and we'll see how how some of our final games in the season go because we have uh we have Utah next way later in the season, but uh we'll we'll see what the standings are then. I I have a good I'm feeling calendar because that might be yeah. market vision market you know I mean? for the division Friday May seventh. We'll we'll have to pay attention to that one, but uh going forward we're looking really good. Jamal Murray is putting together consistent performances. Michael Porter Jr. is finding, you know, more in his bag of tricks and contributing quite a bit defensively as well. And uh, Nikola Jokic is just being Nikola Jokic, and we're, we're finding a way to make it work even without two of our highest paid players in the lineup. We're still getting wins, five out of seven victories, like – it, it's hard not to be encouraged going forward. And uh, our, our next game is, you know, a bit away as we have all-star weekend. So we have to what wait. Who do we got? It's uh, it's on Friday against Memphis. Oh, at yeah, Memphis. We're, we're smacking them. We're yeah. Up. I'm calling right now. 20, 20 points. Yeah. We're going to beat them by at least 20. 20. All right. Uh, I'll go prices right on you and I'll say, I'll say 15. I'll say 15. Just, right. I like Jaw. I like Jaw Morant. 1999. Just like penny under. Just slightly. Just slightly. But no, we're, we're going to put a hurting on him, man. Uh, we're going to be fresh. We're going to be um, well coached after that, coming out the break. We're going to come out hot in that first quarter. It's going to be a hot second quarter. And they're going to be done after that, man. We're winning by 20. I'm telling you. I they, know. Don't want it. they don't want all the heat that the Nuggets are going to be bringing. They don't want that smoke right now. I'm telling Absolutely. you, we're, we're something to be feared. All right. All right. Yep. And fear us, you shall. Uh, Michael, we've done it. We've covered the past two weeks of Nuggets basketball. We talked almost twice as long as we did last week because we're actually excited about how things are going rather than <laughs> upset. But uh, – 
Is there anything else you want to say before we close off this stream? Uh, no, I think we covered everything pretty well, man. I'd say you did an excellent job providing your, uh, your analysis, man. Oh, come on. Come uh, on. <laughs> you can take a compliment. Man. You're too kind, too kind, Captain Introductions. Uh, Captain Introduction now puts on his introduction hat. Uh, yes, sir. For the Rocky Mountain Sports Report and my co-host, Michael Squires, this is Santi Rico for the basketball guys signing off. Thank <laughs> you.